Well, good morning again. The subject I'm gonna talk about today is something that we see going on around us anytime we turn on the TV or listen to the news or if you read the newspaper. And that is the contrast between darkness and light. You know, I, growing up, I, this one thing that was inspelled and instilled in me as I was growing up was, um, there's a reason why the path is wide going one place that none of us want to go or are going, right? And the path that goes to the place we want to go is very narrow. And Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, is really bringing out the contrast of one of those things that will lead you one place or the other. And it's not only true at his time when he's writing this epistle to the uh, Ephesians, it's very much true in our time. And it's something that we have to guard our, our lives on and questions that we'll have to answer at some point in our lives is which way do I want to go? Do I want to go towards salvation through Jesus Christ or do I want to go towards the world which is run by Satan? I, I believe that the people in the congregation and those of us that are joining from the congregation on Zoom know what that choice is, but I'm not sure that many, many people do know what that choice is. And like I say, we see it every day, but it's something that we need to be reminded of because though we've come to Christ and we brought him into our life, and we walk in his life. Our lives from the beginning growing up and so on have had this other thing called darkness in it. You know, we all have the sin streak, every one of us. Anybody that says they've never sinned is like Jesus says, is telling a lie because it's in our nature. But we need to be aware of it because there is another entity out there, Satan, you can call him the tempter, whatever you want to call him, Lucifer, the dragon, whatever. He never sleeps. And he knows the things in the world that we have gone through that, who knows, maybe we enjoyed it at the time because we never thought really when we were younger or middle-aged or what have you. I mean, I'm guilty of everything I'm telling you. And what I'm telling you, I have to be on constant guard because you know it seems like the closer I get to Christ, the more he tries to get in here. He works hard at it. But remember, in James, James tells us, you know, Lucifer, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of here. Be gone. And the scriptures tell me, or tell us, that Satan will be gone. Does that mean he won't come back? I hardly think so. And again, I'm a perfect example. I'm telling him to be gone often. But, but what scripture I've found, and if you truly believe, he will go. Doesn't mean he won't come back. And where I find myself in that situation most often is when I'm asleep. 
now none of you have probably experienced this. I'm probably, you know, one of those unique examples and so on. But when you're sleeping, at least for me, things come in my head I don't want in there. Or my dreams will start on something I don't want to dream about. Because Satan knows the darkness that we've had in our life. And he will do everything in his power. He can't make us do anything, but he sure can prompt us to do the things we don't want to go back to. It's kind of like a smoker. You know, smokers smoke for years. And, uh, you know, and everybody go, you know, says, well, it's not good for you until something happens. And then they, <laughs> they say, well, you got to make a choice. So we quit. The person quits. But what happens when you go back, time passes and you haven't smoked, right? What happens when you smoke that cigarette again? You go right back. The chances are high that you will go right back. Satan knows all these tactics. And he will not give up on us. I wish he would. But James tells us that we have to resist. Now, we're not talking about uh, darkness, you know, like we're walking through darkness or walking through the night. We're talking about darkness that's eternal, not external. The darkness that resides within us. But fortunately, we have Jesus Christ. And what does Jesus do? He places that light, his light, within us. Darkness cannot dispel light. If, if the room is lit and darkness comes in, guess what the room is? It's still lit. However, the reverse is true, that when light is shown in darkness, darkness will dissipate. And that's what Jesus has done for us. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about what Paul told the Ephesians. And I'm going to talk about darkness. And I'm going to go over some scriptures that are right out of the scriptures, right out of the Bible, that address this. And then I'm going to um, talk about the light and scriptures that uh, talk about that as well. But we, it's something that we need to constantly be on the guard. I don't care how young we are or how old we are. We have a choice. We either go um, to heaven, right? And everything I've ever read in the scriptures suggests that heaven is a beautiful place. And when New Jerusalem comes down on the new earth someday, it is a beautiful place. And they have air conditioning, by the way. No, I don't know if they have air conditioning, but I can't imagine it being as the other choice. Because the other choice is, then we go with Satan. And the scriptures tells us in the end what happens to Satan. He is thrown along with the Antichrist and the false prophet in the end into the lake of fire. And I promise you, they have no air conditioning there. There is none. So there's two places. There's, there's a choice between two places that we 
could end up. But whose choice is that? It's our choice. It's the choice we make in this life. In this life. Fortunately, we have Christ. And Paul is telling the Ephesians, they have Christ. So he draws a contrast to the Ephesians, Christians, of their life prior to going to Christ, coming to Christ, and their life after they came to Christ. And it is a contrast. In Ephesians 2.1, this is the before, we, talking about the Ephesians, were dead in transgressions and sins. It must have been really bad. I mean, I look around the world today and it's still really bad. I just can't say that if they had the light in their life, people would do what they do. That's evil. It happened then, the world hasn't ch changed much, right? We still have that. And Earl's personal belief is as we get to the time that Christ appears in the clouds, it's going to get worse. We're going to see it more. And we're going to be tempted to go one way. And when we know we should go the other way. But we have to be strong because we have Christ. And who's stronger? Christ, the Father, or say, scriptures are very clear on that. It's no contest. I prefer to go with the winner. So there's only one choice. But Paul is trying to, um, well, not trying, he's doing it. To convince the Ephesians that they need to walk in the light. Walk in the light. The after, and this comes out of Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. Paul's telling them, but God in his mercy and love made them alive in Christ. Isn't it great to be alive in Christ? That's why I like coming to church so much. That's why you're here so much. Think about it. Raised them up with him, made them to sit with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. The before, here's how he's describing them before. And this is Ephesians 4:22 to 24 ignorant and hard of heart that's pretty you know i think paul takes after christ because christ was pretty blunt didn't didn't mince words paul doesn't mince words either they were taught they were taught to put away their former way of life not all did but they were taught that life that grows corrupt after the lust of deceit. He's describing them in the before. And he, what he's telling them they have to do is to put on the man. You got to remember when this was written, but I would say put on the man or woman. Who in the likeness of God has created, been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Paul calls the Ephesians to be imitators of God. So if he's calling them to be imitators of God, what should we be? Imitators of God. In other words, we should live as close as we can as God wants us. That's not an easy thing to do. 
because Christ told his disciples that people are going to not like you too much. And that isn't the word he used. He says, they're going to hate you because you love me. Not an easy thing to do. That comes out of Ephesians 5, verse 1. But it requires walking in love, abstaining from sexual immorality, and the uncleanliness and covetousness. That's 5 3. He warned them that people who are immoral, unclean, covetous, idolaters will have, and this is a toughie, but this is what Paul told the Ephesians will have no emphasis on no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And that comes out of Ephesians 5. 5. Paul exhorted, don't be partakers with them. He lays it out pretty clear. But these are things we need to hear. We need to hear. So the lesson today, or this, what the, in the, uh, the guide from the church, it says, uh, you know, we're covering Ephesians 5, 8 through 14, but I'm going to go through 5 through 10. Because most of you know me, and I'm cutting it shorter so I can get done on time. And uh, that those verses, uh, five through or eight through ten, chapter five, really says says the bulk of it. Eight a, for you were once darkness, but now light in the Lord. Eight b, walk as children of light. Nine a, for the fruit of the spirit. 9b, in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Verse 10, proving what is well-pleasing to the Lord. So I want, I'm going to quickly kind of break down those five areas. The first being, for you were once darkness, but now light in the Lord. That's 8a. Again, Paul contrasts the before and after. Ephesians before, Christ came into their light and the light was brought into their light and how they are after Christ came into their light. He says with their current lives as people of faith, they are now in the light of the Lord. It all comes, that word faith keeps coming back over and over and over. You know, where is our faith? Is our faith in things or is our faith in the Lord? You know, God promises us what? That we keep the faith, he will always be there. We keep the faith, he will always care for us. If we keep the faith in his son, we will achieve salvation. Um. Note, like I said earlier, that he doesn't say that we they once lived in darkness. He's saying darkness is in here. It's not what you live in. It's what resides in here. Because he says darkness strikes humans right down to the core. However, there is a cure. And it's this gentleman that came a long time ago as our savior, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God. And that's where our salvation comes from. Christ reversed it. So now light illuminates in our life. And when light illuminates in our life, we feel good. Satan is all kinds of mad. 
because he does not want that. His mission, he knows he can't defeat God, but his mission is to make as many humans turn as he possibly can away from Christ. But we can defeat him because we're on the winning side. We just got to stay on the winning side. Light and darkness are often in the Old and New Testament described as good versus evil, chaos versus order, danger versus security, joy versus sorrow, truth versus untruth. Now, remember when Jesus, during the, in the Gospels, as he's speaking, he's always saying, I am telling you the truth. He said that over and over and over to get his point across that he is the truth. He is the light. Uh, life and death. Salvation or condemnation. So I'm going to read you a few scriptures that the scriptures tell us about darkness. In Isaiah 5.20, and I hear people say, oh, the Old Testament. The Old Testament, you know, you only should pay attention to the New Testament. Well, if you read the New Testament and you know the New Testament, it's based upon a lot from the Old Testament. In fact, the Old Testament speaks of things way back when that either now we're at that time coming to fruition or are coming in the future. And oh, by the way, uh, the New Testament talks about the future too. And if you read those prophecies uh, that were in the Old Testament and compare them to the New Testament, throughout it, you will find <laughs> that they're being substantiated. Things we need to be aware of. Isaiah 520, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. In Isaiah 9 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who live in the land of the shadow of death, on them the light has shined. In John 3, now we're in the New Testament, 19 through 21, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light. For the works were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and doesn't come to the light. Least his works would be exposed. You ever notice that many of the things that happen are when? In the light, things happen in the light, daytime. But the majority of things happen at night. And Jesus tells us that's when you go to sleep. Now, unfortunately, there's jobs and so on where people have to have to stay up on it. But we are we are light creatures. We are light creatures. Um, Second Corinthians four four. The God, little G, you know what little G represents? Satan, right? Of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that the light of the good news of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should not draw on them. Satan is active. And Paul's telling us in his letter to the Corinthians to beware. Paul called the Ephesian Christians not to 
walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Be different. It's okay to be different. You know, the, the modern way when we talk about these kinds of things is, you know, peer pressure. People deal with peer pressure. The young ones, teenagers, 20s, 30s, they deal with pre <laughs> uh, peer pressure pretty hard. But so do us older folks. And I'm pointing at me. I fit that category nowadays. So, but I'm proud of it because what's the alternative? You know, the older, me, Vilma and I, we talk about this all the time. She says, oh, I'm getting older. Yeah, but you're still here and I'm glad. You know, I often tell God, um, if today's my day, I'm comfortable. I'm with you. I'm ready. However, I don't know if any of you have ever done this, but I say, however, there's more I can do. So I'll take all the time you can give me in this form. Because I like being human. I, I am not the same person as I was in my younger years. I am a different person. And I'm sure that description fits us in this room and those of us at home. It's a journey. My journey started a little rocky. I was raised in the church. I went to church kicking and screaming whether I wanted to go to or not. And my sister's listening and she can attest. But God bless my mother who didn't give me an out. And even though I strayed away when I went out on my own, it was those things that brought me back. If she hadn't have done that, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. Maybe I would, maybe, you know, Christ would have to get tough with me or something. But the foundation is critically important in one's life. I didn't realize it then, but I clearly understand it now. But he tells them not to walk in their futility, in their minds, uh, being darkened in their understanding. Don't think like them. Don't be alienated from God. Don't be ignorant as they are and don't ha harden your hearts as they do. And he's talking about the Gentiles, not talking about the Jews here. He's talking about the Gentiles. Of course, we don't see any of that kind of stuff happening nowadays. If you believe that, you need to watch the television set. You need to listen to the news, a variety of news. Something we need to be aware of. So here are some scriptures of the light. From Genesis 1, 3, 4. Now we've heard this one. Let there be light, and there was light. Wouldn't you love to have been there at that moment? Christ was. Uh, Psalms 18, 28. God brings light to dispel darkness. Light always wins. Always wins. Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Proverbs 13, 9, the light of the righteous shines brightly, but the lamp of the wicked is snuffed out. Isaiah 60, 19 through 20, the sun shall be no more 
your light by day, neither the brightness shall be the moon give you give light to you. But Yahweh will be to you the everlasting light and your glory, God, your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, neither shall the moon withdraw itself. For Yahweh will be your everlasting light, light, and the days of your mourning shall be ended. Now, this is Isaiah. Do you know what Jesus told uh, John in the book of Revelation? The same thing. Uh, here's Isaiah, 600 years before Christ was born. And here's John on Patmos and going, you know, and Jesus is talk, talking to him about end times and says, hey, of course, this comes at towards the very end. That Jesus, there won't be a need for the sun. There won't be a need for the moon because Christ will be the light. When New Jerusalem comes after the earth is destroyed, and it will be destroyed if you believe in the scriptures. It won't be man. God will do it if you believe in the scriptures. But when New Jerusalem comes down on the new earth, there won't be any need for light bulbs. Because God and Christ's light will light the place up. It will never be dark. So you better go get you some, those night blinders if you need them to sleep. No, I, I, I have no idea if we'll, we will ever need to sleep. Probably not. I know we can eat. Christ says that. I know that we can drink fluids. Christ says that. I know that New Jerusalem is 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep, and 1,500 miles high. So my apartment will probably be 1,500 miles up in the air. Uh, and I thought, gosh, they don't make elevators that go up that high. But what are we promised when we get our new and improved bodies? We'll be able to do the things that Christ does. He can walk through doors. Didn't the scriptures tell us that? He was here for 40 days. He only spent four days with the disciples. So where'd he go? We know the answer to part of that, don't we? Through the Book of Mormon. And I'm sure there are other places he visited. Now, how'd he get there? He had to get a ticket on an airplane? Nope. Probably just like that. I guess we'll know when we get there. But if that's, he was here for 40 days, that means he had 36 days to visit others. Because the scriptures tell us, he tells his disciples, I have other sheep I must attend. Doesn't tell us who those sheep are in the Bible. But we have an idea of who some of those sheep were. Jesus said in Matthew 4, or Matthew 5, 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. I like that but we'll have the light of life. In Acts 26, 18, Jesus calls Saul to minister to the Gentiles, right? He became Paul, we know that. And why? To open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive remission of sins and inheritance among those who are sacrificed by faith in me. 
all examples of the importance of life. First Thessalonians 5, 5, 5 through 6. You are all children of light, the children of the day. We don't belong to the night nor the darkness. In Revelation 21, 23, 24. The city has no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine, for the very glory of God illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk in the light. The Jews, they walked. They used the word walk a lot. And what and when they used the word walk, it was to speak, it was to speak of the manner in which one conducts one's life. So if we walk in the light, we should see a different result than when we walked in the darkness. I think that's a safe assumption. We should. I'm gonna give you a few examples of people who walked with God. Enoch and Noah. Enoch did it in Genesis, Genesis 5, 22 and 24. Noah tells us that he walked with God in Genesis 6 and 9. God challenged Abr Abram. Did you know when God challenged Abram, who became Abraham, right? Do you know he was 99 years old when that happened? When we think about 99, we think of that as old. Back in his day, he was probably still a teenager or something, you know, but he was 99 years old. And God tells him, walk before me and be blameless. In Psalms 1.1, the psalmist says, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners. In Ezekiel 5, 6, 8, God executed judgments on the Israelites for failing to walk in his statutes or failing to keep his laws. So Paul calls the Ephesians to walk in the light of Christ. I believe he's talking to us too. We are called to walk in the light of Christ, but we need to be aware that there is a darkness and that Satan wants that light to be snuffed. But if we stand true, we know that darkness cannot dispel the light. Only the other can happen. Only. And we're called to help others who don't have that understanding to come to the light. And the only way that we're really gonna convince people to, to come to the light is through what? Our example of what the light has done in our lives. If, if you talk it, but don't walk it, it ain't gonna happen. It isn't gonna happen. Sorry, I used the word ain't. But my childhood coming back, you know. But it's not gonna happen. We have to stay true. You know, the word, Paul uses the word truth more in the Ephesians epistle, in Ephesians, than any other word than any other word. And the last thing I'm just gonna talk about real quickly, where it says, for the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit. A fig tree only bears figs. Grape vines only produce grapes, right? Uh, olive trees produce olive. And in Luke, it tells us that uh, 
Luke 6, 44, each tree is known by its own fruit. For people don't gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from the bramble bush. And he goes on to say, the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings out which is that which is good. And the evil man or woman um, out of the treasure of his or her heart brings out that which is evil. So basically, what that's telling us is that trees do what they're doing because that's the nature, that way God created it. And if we're doing evil or we're doing good, uh, it comes back to what's in our heart, what's our nature. But we can help others overcome that. We all have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We know that Jesus promised that to the disciples. It happened on the day of Pentecost. And they all received it. And they were able to do things and remember things that I know got under Jesus' skin, according to the scriptures. But now, with the Holy Spirit, they clearly understood and did things that they thought they couldn't do. Because now they fully had the light of Christ in their life. And I stand here before you today to tell you that we have the light of Christ in our lives. And that through the Holy Spirit, we can do things that we thought were never imaginable. I don't care if we're member or in priesthood because we're all on this middle plane right here we are all called to spread the light to the people around us who are suffering from that eternal darkness in their lives and we have the holy spirit to get us there who does the Holy Spirit work for? God. God can do anything. There is nothing that is not in God's power to do. The only key ingredient that really comes down to is this five-letter word. It starts with an F. I said five-letter word. It starts with an F. And the word is faith. Our faith is the only thing that holds us back. And it's the same thing that Jesus told the disciples throughout the gospels what was holding them back. But once they got the Holy Spirit, they overcame it. We have the Holy Spirit. So what I wanna leave you with is uh, just beware. We've all had darkness in our life, eternal darkness. We've all come to the light. It's changed our life. Or we wouldn't be sitting here or at home viewing in. But we need to be aware that there is a force out there that isn't giving up on trying to get us to backslide. You know what backslide means, right? Go back to the way it was. Stand up. Be strong. Tell him to go, just like James tells us. He will go. He can't make us do a thing that we don't choose to do. And as long as we got God and his, you know, the Father and the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit with us, we have nothing to fear. Of course, that's easy to say, but we're human, so that, but where does fear come from? Think about that. And, you know, here's, here's the way you're all things. If I lose my life, so what? I'll just transition to the new life. And from everything that I've learned, that's better than where I am now. 
So what is there to fear? Took me a long time to come to grips with that one. But it's something we all need to think about. Because we have the power that Christ gave us, gave his disciples through the Holy Spirit. Each and every one of us. And he loves you. So um, I know this was pretty deep today. But the, the world church had the theme. But I enjoy these themes myself. But I really think it's something that we as people, as humans, as members of Christ's body, need to be consciously aware of. And be on our full vigilance. You know that there is another force out there. But don't be afraid of it. Tell him to go away. He'll go away. Do it in the name of Jesus, and it's amazing what can happen.